everyone. Welcome back to uh, Getting to Know You. We took a little holiday break, well-needed holiday break, I'm sure for everyone, uh, but excited to get back into the swing of things. I, I wish everyone a happy new year and, and, a, and a better 2021. Um, uh, our guest uh, this week, uh, long overdue uh, to this, but he is such a fixture and, and upfront in the parish uh, presence that uh, I thought it was okay to wait a little bit because everyone is very familiar with this person, but um, such an interesting man with uh, so many different interests and uh, 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 skills and talents and uh, excited to get to talk to him. Um, he's an old friend of mine. I'll get into that in a little bit, but uh, uh Today's guest is Mike Kaminsky. Hi, Mike. How are you? Very well. I'm so, so happy to be here. So honored to be with you. Thanks, John. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, Dr. John. <laughs> Dr. John. You know, I am so proud of you, um, of all that you've accomplished. Uh, your, your whole, you know, career is just amazing. And we at St. Sebastian are unbelievably fortunate to have you. So it's an honor to say Dr. John. Well, thank you. you you're going to you're making me blush, and I, I, I tend to ignore that because uh, the imposter syndrome often uh, surfaces up. But uh, but I, I do appreciate that. Thank you. Um, yeah, and and you say you're proud of me because because you and I you have known me since I was a little boy. Uh, you were uh, the liturgist at Saint John Vianney when I was a child uh, at that parish. So you, we've known each other a very long time. Yes, we have. So your parents' kids, you. Yeah. And my kids used to hang out. We would go to each other's homes for meals. That's right. And we had uh, a wonderful time. And so I, uh, yes, I have known you for a long, long time. Well, and, and many of my, um, many of my foundational experiences of church were in unknowingly to you probably uh, were, were, were you playing the piano and, and singing the songs and, and creating the atmosphere of liturgy that, um, that really helped shape who I was, along with other people, good pastors and, and good teachers. But, but for sure, um, when I was coming to St. Sebastian's, I knew, oh, I have a familiar face here. And I, I was excited to tell my mom and my dad about, hey, guess where I'm going and guess who's there. So sure. anyway. you know what you say about, you know, the fact that you grew up in, I'll say my culture. Yeah. Um, in fact, was an interesting saying that the pastor at St. John Vianney, uh, who was a prof at the seminary, uh, taught me. He said, he was a nice guy, and, and he, he would say, Mike, be careful what you teach people. They will learn it. <laughs> and isn't that true? You know, and so we do. We have a responsibility. You know, we never know how far the things we, we do will go. And, and that's just the very thing you're alluding to here. So here you sit, you know, a product of, of me and, and certainly many, many, many others, and I a product of others. And we all have to be careful about what we teach and, and do it well. Yeah, so essentially what you're saying is uh, people suffering through this uh, web series, it's all your fault. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so blame Mike. Any complaints go to Mike. Um, okay, so I have a little format for this. And, and the first the first question, uh, I, people know you well, but I'm sure there are things they don't know about you. So so first question is, um, tell us about yourself, Mike. What, what do we need to know about you? Uh, I, I am told that I'm an enigma. <laughs> uh, actually, that was told me just a few days ago by a trusted mm -hmm. friend. Uh, so I don't know that I fit any kind of a box, uh, be it Catholic or male or uh, American. Um, uh, so that I, I'm somewhat proud of that. I, I would say I'm a seeker. I am a lifelong learner. I would always, I, I taught at Alverno for over 25 years and, and I have, I don't know about you, but I was never, I know you teach at a college. I, I never was taught how to teach, you know, and I admire teachers who are trained, who, you know, have the, the skills, the discipline to teach. And in college, you don't have to do that. And so I would get up into the, in front of every class and I would say, I have no credentials to teach. I'm not a trained teacher. <laughs> right. However, right. however, um, I can confidently stand before you because I know this material backwards and forwards 
and I'm passionate about it. And the main reason why I can stand in front of you is because you probably won't find a better student. Mm -hmm. When you're a good student, that is one of the key things for being a good teacher. So like I just say, I'm, I'm a lifelong learner. Yeah. Uh, so stuff for me, you know, I studied in, in Poland uh, for five years, actually three, and then I worked there for five years, for the other two years. What, what years were, what, when were you in Poland? Uh, you know, I, we could talk for hours and hours about that. That was um, 79 through 84-ish, uh, in very turbulent years, uh, Reagan, uh, and it was um, still communist Poland, and uh, we had uh, Lech Wałęsa and the Solidarity Movement, mm -hmm. and I lived through all of that. So mm -hmm. I had, you know, uh, militia uh, gun to my belly, um, and oh. we had riots. Uh, my firstborn was born in Warsaw in the middle of a riot, tear gas um, that we had to live through. I, I could just tell you stories and stories. Mm. Um, mm. And, and even when I was guest conducting so many uh, orchestras, all of the programs had to be approved by the communist government, you know, because everything had to look fine, you know, don't, nothing too serious, you know, wow. you know, make sure it's uplifting and, and so make, pretend that everything's fine, you wow. know. Wow. Um, so, you know, P Poland was a, a, a very big, big part of my, uh, my career uh, in growing up. Um, but, you know, I, I mostly, as you can see behind me, I love books. I, I, I love studying um, and uh, I, I love, love, love teaching. And uh, I love performing. I love music. I love life. I love cooking. Uh, so... Um, it's evident to me that you love teaching, I mean, from uh, a variety of places, but most recently, <clears throat> you and I partnered on a RCA, with an RCAA group, I brought them into the church, and you, um, I said, just, you know, I, what did I say to you, like, give, you know, if you give them a 20, 30 minute tour of the church, and an hour and a half later, people were still huh. wanting to hear the details that you were talking about, and it was clear, you know, as you said to your students, I am passionate about it. I mean, your, your passion was very clear. Thank you. And, and passion means everything to me. And, and it's contagious. Mm -hmm. And I think if we can, I think everybody has passion, if only we could help people find their own passions. Uh, you know, it's empowerment. And, and uh, when people experience people of passion, uh, it, it is exciting. You've, you've experienced that we all, you know, when we have uh, all, just an amazing professor or uh, a neighbor or a car mechanic, you know, who's just like, you know, just deftly wields all of the, the tools that I don't know anything about. It's just, a, a, you know, joy to experience. And it, and it awakens in all of us a desire to be more. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's great. That, that, that's a good setup. Um, my, my second question is, <clears throat> and then we can kind of get into the roles you play uh, at SEBS, uh, but as a, a, a precursor to that, tell me about, uh, you talked about your passion, but talk about your faith a little bit. Tell me about your faith. Uh, my faith is as much of the seeker part as anything, if not probably the most fundamental part of seeker. Hmm. Um, I have always sought to know the mind of God. Uh, and I've, I've prayed about that, you know, help me to know your mind. And uh, I am extremely respectful of the way in the, the infinite ways in which God manifests um, amongst us. And I think that uh, there is, I think I'm sorry to cut you off, but I think that speaks to your philosopher mind because you said, God, help me know your mind. And my first reaction was, I think I would ask the question, God, let me know your heart. But that says so much about the intellectual that you are, I think. That's very interesting. I've not thought of it that way. Mm -hmm. And I, I think you're right. Um, I, I'm not an insensitive person. Uh, in, uh, many people might find me as, a, as a, a cold, calculated person because I am so <laughs> methodical. Spock was my hero. But uh, I think you're right. Uh, the philosophy and the thinking, um, the knowing, uh, the understanding of complexity uh, is really, really important to me. Uh, nothing is really simple in black and white, uh, in spite of what, how many people either like to or need to live. Uh, that's just not, not how life is. So uh, yeah, that, so that's a, the, the faith part is really significant. So I would say um, for faith, uh, very much into uh, comparative religion, uh, wanting to not miss 
some part of the of the holy's experience uh as it manifests in ways that are not part of my experience and to the point um that or to, i should say to the degree that when speaking sometimes people will ask me why are you catholic mm. In fact, Margaret Lee at uh, one of the confirmation programs had me actually answer that question in front of the confirmants. You know, why are you Catholic? And my answer always has been and, and will continue to be, well, that's just because how I grew up. So, you know, we all grow up in a particular culture. Um, if it's male, uh, if it's in our case, you know, American and in our case, Catholic. And, and I have to say, if the Catholic church was not big enough for me i'd be out in a second mm -hmm. but there is so much awe and mystery and truth within the catholic church but it does not possess all of the truth mm -hmm. you know this this truth is bigger than all of us and and so to the degree that i best know the catholic faith i will operate within the catholic faith yeah. uh if if i was buddhist i'd probably be a really great buddhist you know and so on so um, it's what I know, and uh, I, I have wanted to know more and more and more of it because, as you would know, in the Catholic Church, there's more and more and more to know. There's no end to that, and uh, it's interesting, my start, I don't know if you know this, um, I actually started, like, so-called working for the church in seventh grade. So did I, I tell you that story? I was just about to ask you that. I was, I, I knew you were always a musician. How did you get going? With well, the actually, I started on accordion, and back in my day, you know, grade schools had accordion orchestras. Fantastic. So at my little St. Adalbert, you know, on the south side of Milwaukee grade school, we had, oh, golly, probably 30 or 40 accordions. And, wow. I, and so there was accordion A and accordion B and accordion C. And we used to play, you know, pieces. Well, anyway, the pastor there knew that I played accordion. And when I was in seventh grade, the... And I, I loved music and we had this great organist and he would bring, you know, trumpets to Christmas and so on and so forth. And I just lived for that. We would hike it, you know, a mile and a half to church in the snow for midnight mass and the trumpets would be, you know, glorious. Well, one Christmas, seventh grade, there was not only uh, no trumpet, there was no music. And I was devastated. Like, can you imagine a little kid devastated? <laughs> And I was little Mike Kamansky angry. And so I, the, like a few days later, I told my mom, I, I'm going to go to the pastor's, you know, rectory. And I knocked on the door, you know, and the sub pastor answers. And, and, he, and I, I was really upset. And he said, what can I do? And I said, I need to talk to you. And this is a seventh grader. And, you know, back in the days when you don't say boo to the priest. Of course, yeah. And, and he said, well, come on into my office. And, and he said, what's the matter? And I said, how could you not have music for Christmas? And and he said, oh, I'm so sorry, but the organist just could not be here. And uh, and I said, that's terrible. That's terrible. I was just really upset. <laughs> so he he's, then he says to me, within seconds, he says, would you like the keys to the organ? All of a sudden, my mood changes. And I said, yeah. Smart pastor. And he <laughs> says, here's the key to the organ. Here's the key to the choir loft. Here's the key to the church. Figure out the organ. And when you're ready to play on Sunday, we'll have you play for mass. I never had organ lessons. I only played accordion. Hmm. I never played anything with my left hand. Hello, because it's, you know, buttons. Yeah. Hello, I never did anything with my feet. <laughs> and, I, and there were like hundreds and hundreds of buttons that I didn't know. So I would go after school and just push every button to figure it out. And uh, so I started not only playing uh, the organ, but I started conducting the choir. Little Mike Kamensky, seventh grader, you know, and all I knew from Lawrence Welk is conductors had these big, eight, you know, 20 inch batons. So I told my mom, you know, take me to the, the music store. I want a baton. And we had, you know, eight people in the choir. And so Mike Kamensky is conducting eight people <laughs> with my big baton. And they listened to me. They did whatever I told them they, you know, should do. I composed, you know, Gregorian chant masses, you know, and, and, you know, and then, oh, about, I don't know, 15 years ago at uh, Stritch, they were planning some music program uh, and they were, they asked several of us music directors to come and just tell them our stories about how we got into the business. 
and I thought mine was unique, you know, starting in seventh grade. Well, mm -hmm. you know, there's Michael Bacho and Lee Erickson and so on and so forth. All of them started in grade school. Common, common story. It's a, I didn't know that. Yeah. Know that either. Well, you know, it, it's interesting. I, I mean, I, I have a similar story too, where, you know, well, you, you watched me. I, I, I just would, so, so many ministers, I think, are organically grown. <clears throat> you know, like I, I just was, I'm, my mom was the church lady and I just kept showing up and then I just kind of never left. And that, and, and, and that's often, often the case. But, um, you know, I, I would say uh, a method that God uses to call people to ministry sometimes. Exactly, exactly. And the only question there is, are our ears open? Yeah, yeah, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. But it's it's presented to, to all of us, like right there, often on a silver platter. You know, so did you, did you have piano training? No. Seriously? No, no. no. And, and so we had a, a an old upright uh, piano at my house as a kid, and I have never seen anybody play it. It was one of those um, player pianos where you, you pump, you know, your feet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so my family would come and they would just put the rolls in and they would pump it. And that's the only way as a kid, I ever saw this piano work. <laughs> so one day I asked my mom, you know, will will I hurt the piano if I touch it? <laughs> and she said, no, no. So I just started, you know, playing. And so I just taught myself piano. Oh. And when I was in high school, uh, the music teacher there just heard me, you know, futzing around on the piano. And she said, for the next high school concert, I want you to play Rhapsody in Blue. I don't know if you know, that, you know, by Gershwin. Mm -hmm. That's a piano concerto. Yeah. You, you and it, but, yeah. I didn't know the piece, you know. So I just said, you know, when when adult says something to you, just you just say yes. So I said, yes, okay. So I went to the music store, got my, you know, Rhapsody in Blue for a solo piano. And it is just dastardly difficult. I mean, it is a full-blown concerto. Mm. I had never had any piano lessons. I taught myself the entire Rhapsody in Blue and performed it by memory for a high school concert. And I did my uh, audition at um, college for my undergrad degree at, at UWM. And so I played, you know, all this stuff and the teacher saying, well, how many years have you studied? And I, I said to the professor, uh, I've never had a lesson ever. Mm. And so my first piano lesson was in college, actually. No kidding. Yep. Wow. And 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 now I I don't I hope this is okay to say, but so often I'm watching you in mass, and I and I'm very conscious that you you don't I mean, you 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 have music, but you often don't need it. Right. Is is that just because you've been? Is that just your gift, or is that because you've been doing it so long, or is that just? Uh, it's a combination of a lot of things like uh, people are amazed that I have so many things by memory and I just tell them, look, if you played, you know, I has not seen a thousand times, you're going to finally figure it out. <laughs> um, so that's one thing. It is, there's a lot of repetition. Yeah. Uh, you're right. There is a lot of gift. That's true. Uh, I do obviously, hello, know how to read music. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm a trained conductor, so I, I know how to read lots of music. But uh, the other thing is, sadly, our uh, church publishers are not of the highest musical level. Mm -hmm. And so often the accompaniments that are provided are uh, very poorly written, even by the composers themselves, not to mention the arrangers. Mm -hmm. And I, I worked for Hal Leonard for over a decade. I used to do professional arranging. I mean, I still do. Mm -hmm. and, and so what I do is better than anything that, you know, anybody is publishing not to mention you have to remember that these publishers understandably are publishing for people at much less skill right so they have to somewhat dumb it down when i was uh, writing at hell letter they often taught us um when you're writing for the general public put a pencil in your fingers and and so when you when you, if you can play what you wrote with pencils in your fingers then it's going to be easy enough for somebody to play Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Cause there's, the, the, as we all know, there's a wide variety of <laughs> qualities in, in church music. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. We don't want to go there. <laughs> there's some wonderful church music too. Um, so, uh, uh, and, and you, you've been at SEVS for how long? Uh, 
uh, over 20 years. I want to say, I think this is my 24th year, maybe. Wow. Wow. Okay. That, that's a long time. Yes. <laughs> you were seeing a lot in the parish. Yes. <laughs> um, t- I, people see what you do, but maybe talk a little bit about the role you play in the parish, um, things that people might not know uh, that, that you do. Yeah, one of the, thank you for asking. One of the most common misunderstandings is that uh, people think it's a really cushy job. I get to sit twenty, you know, uh, forty hours a week just playing the piano, you know, and on the organ and just practicing. Yeah. And uh, sadly, for most musicians, and not this is not just me, there is so much work to do that we rarely get to practice uh, to the point where shame on us, shame on me, we don't practice. Um, I have a, a retired colleague, Sister Mary Jane Wagner, who was the music director at the cathedral, who religiously uh, practiced. She she said, I will never, ever have less than X number of hours daily practicing uh, in my profession. And that was sacred to her. And I really admire her for doing that. I, I don't have the administrative discipline to do that. There's just so much stuff right. that is asked of us. So um, the surprise for people might be how much administration there is behind the work that we do. Um, and uh, also, in addition to music and liturgy, and, and people also might not know there, too, that with the, the director of liturgy and director of music, there's a, a big umbrella under the liturgy part as well. Yeah. So I have a lot of responsibilities, not the least of which, hello, is all of the stuff to, to make, for instance, Christmas happen with all of the ticketing. So I personally was the one to have to put that all together. Or for instance, training of the uh, ushers and the, for that matter, the priests and the congregation for safety. So I have done all of the Homeland Security and FBI training for active shooters. I have tomorrow, I have another uh, uh, FBI training session for uh, an update on all of the active shooters. Wow. So this is also, I mean, it's not stuff I went to school for, no. but it's all part of the the liturgy and the music, you know, umbrella. But then beyond that, with the pastoral associate uh, role is uh, some counseling of, and I'm very, very, uh, very grateful for that role, uh, particularly with regard to marriage. And so I actually, in my responsibility, mostly under the pastoral associate umbrella would be for marriage. So I run the entire marriage program. So I do all of the canonic paperwork, uh, itself, again, administration, having to, to work with all the canon lawyers at the archdiocese, work through all of the annulments and all of the uh, validations and all of the, the tricky paperwork and, and, and you know, uh, difficulties with couples, you know, having to get married uh, because one is being deployed in the military or, I mean, just countless, countless stories of, that are just messy and complicated. And, and so that's a huge part of my job. And then also, I have a counseling license with Prepare and Rich, um, so I'm very proud of that. Um, to be administering, I think the the country's best uh, program for engaged couples, and not just engaged. Uh, uh, we work with couples uh, of any level, married, you know, zero to five years, five to twenty five years, twenty five plus years. So uh, we we meet work with lots of different couples uh, in in marriage counseling. So that's that's a huge part of um, my responsibility and, and ministry at SEPS. So I'm, I'm very, very fortunate to do that. I really enjoy that. Yeah, part, um, uh, I, I always say being a minister in the church, you, you are often witness to people's greatest joys and, and greatest sorrows. Uh, and- that is so true. You, you know, like even uh, the funeral ministry. So I run, I run that as well. And so uh, when, families are grieving, uh, I meet with them uh, as, as the person is dying, uh, after the person has died. Uh, I have to say one of my um, greatest moments and, and um, honors is to be with a family, to, to plan the liturgy. And I take it very, very seriously. And, and people are, they don't know, you know, what to expect. And many of them are unchurched, you know, uh, don't know what to expect when they come. And I get so many letters from people thanking me for those those meetings because they're so pastoral. They, they feel so comfortable, safe space to say things that they had not even known they needed to say. And siblings hearing stories from other siblings that, that came out by virtue of this meeting that nobody ever thought of, you know, because dad did this or dad did that or whatever. 
Yeah, we so get, there's a lot of healing in those sessions. We get to meet with, uh, we get to meet people at their most vulnerable. Yes, is- and do we right? And do we have the skill? And and uh, are we open to the how the spirit moves in those meetings to allow those important moments, sacred moments, to occur? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, good. Well, um, that that's enlightening. Thank you. Um, I, I, I obviously know a lot of that because I see you. Uh, we we pass each other in the halls, but I, I don't think I don't think people always. Uh, you know, you, you you see what you see. You don't see all the behind the scenes, and, and there's a lot of behind the scenes when it comes to, to, to church. So there is. I mean, there's there are several PhDs I'd love to get, and one of them would be in psychology. Um, so I'm. That's another one of my hobbies is um, <laughs> is reading uh, psychology. Uh, Thomas More, two O's M O O R E, care of the soul. Mm-hmm. You know, I have I've read many books by him. James Hillman. Um, so just, I, I love the whole study of, of psychology, um, how, and, how and, people and interact. It, yeah, it all blends in, into, I mean, the, the care of the person, right? The, the dignity right. of the person is what we're all about. Hopefully, that's right. what we're all about. So. Right. Um, and, and that actually leads into my last question, which is, uh, you know, Mike, what are, what, as you look to the future, uh, you just taught, you referenced um, uh, put, putting together Christmas in, in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, what, what's your hopes uh, for the future? Uh, I, I really am taken aback at this moment in history to learn things that I, and maybe it's my naivete. um, I was, I have to admit, unprepared for the deep division between people. Mm -hmm. I would have naively thought that any um, difficulties between people would be really very minuscule that most people, the majority, 80, 90% of people had similar opinions and, and, and viewed things similarly and so on. And so I am just really, really stunned by this. So I'm learning as much as I can about um, all of this, um, trying to understand why people have the, the, the views that they do. Mm-hmm. So my hope um, short-term would be, uh, again, being a seeker, I, my hope would be that people take these opportunities uh, for what they are. They are opportunities to learn more about the other and more about self. And it is an opportunity to hone our conflict resolution skills. Um, yeah. And and so at, at, at this short term, you know, if it's uh, political or, or uh, religious, whatever differences we have, that we spend the time to learn more about the other, to, to a- actively listen to the other. Uh, and that's a, a sadly not a, a common trait here in our country. We don't well listen. I have to just say real quickly, um, one of our uh, skill building exercises in marriage preparation is active listening. And we spend time with couples and they're getting married. They, you would think they would read each other's minds and they come into our home, not now, we do it virtually now, but they would come into our homes and we do these active listening sessions and they are blown away, learning stuff about each other. They're getting married <laughs> and they didn't know these deep, deep things because they never took the time. And then the kicker at the end of one of these sessions so frequently is, I wish my boss listened to me that way. Mm. Mm. So in the workplace, there's no time often for people to actually listen to each other. And so active listening is really, really, really critical. Um, so short-term, long-term goals, I would say um, I, I place my hope, uh, and I don't mean to do this in a way that um, shirks responsibility for us or me, but my hope is in the youth. Yeah. I am sad that a generation before me and, and two generations before me, and perhaps even my own generation, lived lives that were wasteful and abusive uh, to the earth. And 
it is such a joy to hear young people championing the cause of things of of the earth you know ecology and uh we we have made some very very bad turns in in society and you know for all of the what's that stewardship would be a word stewardship yes you know for all of the graces of of uh, mechanization we have yet still not learned some of the most fundamental truths necessary for survival survival you know and not uh, just trying to take more and more and more from, from me, me, me. Uh, so we have to be a, an other-centered uh, culture. And that's going to take for Americans a big twist. And unfortunately, you know, we need these big wake-up calls before we f- even see that there's a problem, unfortunately. Uh, so my hope is with the youth because I do hear and see so many young people, you know, speaking to the United Nations on behalf of the earth. And uh, so many young people speaking up on behalf of uh, other children and uh, uh, abuses of children uh, and, um, you know, sex trafficking and just on and on and on. Yeah. Um, there's so many important things. And uh, like I say, I don't mean to to dump dump this all on, on our children, no. um, but it is their time to step up and we need to listen to them. And they have a lot to say. Yeah, I, 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 I don't think you're passing the buck at all. I think you're, you're trying to, you have a spirit of empowering the next generation. I mean, we all do what we can and then, and then we have to pass that on. And I, I agree with you. There's a spirit in uh, young adults right now that is much more conscious of the, of the great gifts we've been given in this world and, and how we have to be more respectful of that. So I, I, I and I, I, as we come out of the, um, I know we just finished the Christmas season, but as we come out of, uh, I spent so much time reflecting on Advent, just that spirit of hope. Uh, I think we have to have hope in the next generation or, or, uh, or, or we're in trouble. And I do, I, I, I would um, agree with you that there's a lot of hope in the next generation. There is, there really, really is. Yeah. Good. Well, that's a good place to leave this, Mike. Thank you um, so much for uh, agreeing to talk with us uh, this morning. And uh, we look forward to uh, listening to your beautiful music uh, in church and uh, seeing the wisdom and guidance that you have for St. Sebastian's Parish. So thank you so much. It's my honor and pleasure. Thank you, John, for the invite. Absolutely. Have a good day.